Yes, my name is Stephanie Mansurin. Um, welcome to this uh, session on research that we have been doing on human dimensions of forest landscape restoration. So I'm an independent consultant and um, an associate researcher with the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. And I'm also an outgoing board member of the Society for Ecological Restoration. This um, research, could we have the slide please? Thank you. This research is a collaborative effort among um, several researchers that you can see um, listed up here. And I'm very happy to have uh, three of them with me here today who will join me now on the stage. And we're each going to present a bit of this, this work. So we've got, um, I'll introduce you when we get to our different stages. Thank you. Um, so, yes, this was a collaborative effort among four different organizations that you can see uh, listed on the front page of this report and different uh, scientists representing different regions, different disciplines and different organizations. Um, so we're very pleased to present to you today just a glimpse of this year-long research, um, which um, we're very pleased um, um, to present now. So, um, the reason we're here on the innovation stage is that much of the effort to date in restoration, in forest landscape restoration, but more generally in ecosystem restoration, has focused on some of the species that need to be planted, on some of the ecological aspects, very much on the role of carbon. Um, and although there are principles about engaging stakeholders, for example, there's much less effort and attention to the broader human dimensions of forest landscape restoration. So this is a huge black box that we basically sought out to um, dig into and to explore through this research. So the aims of this report were basically to understand the linkages between human aspects and the restoration process in order to be able to intervene in this process to better understand what are the leverage points. And also finally to provide some tools for uh, practitioners so that they can actually uh, better engage in forest landscape restoration and to better understand these human dimensions. So the audience for our research is essentially practitioners, um, but also researchers um, and academics um, so that they can actually better understand and better integrate these aspects in their work. And although, I should add, although much of this effort is on forest landscape restoration, we believe that most of the outcomes of our research are applicable to ecosystem restoration more generally. So now to dig a little bit deeper into what are these human dimensions, I'd like to invite my colleague uh, and co-author Ida Janonta, who is um, assistant professor at Penn State University, to just unravel a little bit for us um, what are these human dimensions of forest landscape restoration. Ida, over to you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, so human dimensions refers to how and why humans value natures and natural resources. In our case here, we're talking about forests and tree resources and how humans want those resources to be managed, how humans affect and are affected by the use and the management decision of those resources. So what I'm trying to convince here is that human dimensions are much more broader than just the social and the economic aspect. They are also about the historical, the cultural, the institutional, and the political aspect. And when we look at the FLR process um, from design to implementation to the learning lesson, which my colleague Pablo will talk about later on, um, you will see that those human dimensions that I just mentioned about kind of intersect across all of the steps of the process. So in the report that you have, uh, we have um, kind of talked about the five pillars of human dimensions that I'm going to go through right now. 
So those five pillars, the first one is the contest. And it is about the contest in which FLA or any restoration um, take place. For instance, it could be actively manage rural landscapes that support local livelihood, which means that wherever local communities um, use those landscapes as part of their livelihood. It could also be about the structural legacies and the institutional conditions that characterize the context in which landscape restoration is uh, implemented. The second pillar, as you can see, is about the motivation of different stakeholders to restore, which could um, translate into different ecosystem goods and services sought by different actors and the ways in which they want to do that restoration. The third pillar that we have is about the restoration activities themselves. And those are the ones that will be carried out as part of the restoration process. And they should be informed and defined by the stakeholders in those landscapes. Um, the, third, the fourth pillars are the influencing factors. These are really important. And they, because they affect the restoration process and it could be about power dynamics in decision-making process and also benefit, cost and benefit distribution, value and knowledge system, we hear a lot about those one, and institutional factors. The last pillar uh, about, is about the outcomes, and here we want to focus on the social outcomes that restoration is supposed to deliver. And those could be contributions to livelihood, contributions to economic opportunities, such as income, enhanced food production, and or sustainable energy, depending on the case. And finally, improved health. We know that forests also support human health. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ida. So now to actually understand or start to understand how human dimensions interrelate with the process of forest landscape restoration. Ida mentioned from um, defining the landscape right through to implementing um, and learning from the process. So to do that, I'd like to ask Pablo Pacheco, um, Global Forest Lead Scientist at WRF to please briefly tell us how they interrelate. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Stephanie. So there's some sort of agreements that there are five stages in the FLR process. And those uh, stages, you up in there. Oh, the first one is assess, the second is uh, plan, the third is implement, the fourth one is analyze, adapt, and sustain, and the fifth one is to is to learn and implement or disseminate. Uh, so we can say that the stakeholders that are going to be somehow uh, affected or uh, involved in the FLR process, they should not only be engaged or participate in some of these stages of the process, but they have to take an active role along the whole process, so along these different stages. So, for example, when we look at the assessing stage, I think we think that's critically important that before even uh, engaging in restoration is to understand the perspectives of the different actors about causes of deforestation and land degradation. On the planning, for example, we think also that uh, the restoration process has to be co-created with the people who depend on those resources and whose livelihoods depend on the restoration process. Uh, but also involving other stakeholders that may have a stake in these landscapes as well. In the implementation stage also, I think it's critical that the stakeholders they embrace the restoration options that, that, that make sense to them and that they are going to meet their needs and aspirations. Uh, on, the, uh, on the sustain and uh, analyze, also I think it's important to develop like co-adaptive management mechanisms that should involve the stakeholders in the process and create processes for co-learning as well that could feed into this uh, adaptive uh, co-management. So uh, in short, I would say that uh, we think that restoration is going to succeed 
only if the human dimensions are going to be take, taken very seriously along, along the process. And there are examples in which uh, this, this, this have, have been done. Uh, WWF, we are working with colleagues in Mexico, for example, with communities, uh, trying to incorporate all these different five dimensions in uh, restoration programs that we have in, in Oaxaca, for example. Yeah, so that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much, Pablo. So, yes, you've already outlined why these human dimensions are important. So, if we take, for example, um, in, Tan in Tanzania, village forests, um, clearly for the local communities, forests are really important for supply of non-timber forest products, for their sacred values, for a whole range of values, but it's not just local communities. It's also different motivations and different interests of the stakeholders at different levels that we need to understand. So private companies will have a different interest and a different motivation to restore or degrade forests. The government might have a different interest. They might be looking at restoring forests for disaster risk reduction, for example. So understanding these different motivations and the different interests at different stages in the process help us to better determine interventions for restoration. But now maybe thinking of going forward, what are the next steps having now carried out this research? I'd like to invite Michael Kleiner from IUFRO, um, Deputy Director of IUFRO and Coordinator of the Special Program to Develop Capacities to tell us a few words about how IUFRO is going to take it forward. Yeah, thank you very much, Stephanie, for this question. Although we all know that FLR has always been named and um, interpreted as an intervention into a social ecological system, the, uh, the tools and methods really to implement this, really to take social consideration into account, as we have heard, in planning, uh, uh, in assessing, and then of course sustaining is so, so important. Therefore, capacity development, knowledge sharing workshops in all its forms, from online to classroom to field work and field facilitation is so important. So UFRO in the past as well as also now in future through SPDC and other programs definitely will continue supporting this and particularly taking now these social tools, specific social tools out of this report and integrate this in our future training workshops. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Good to hear that it's got a life beyond just a report. So, I think, I thank you for your attention. I don't want to take any more time. We've got, there's another session right after us. Uh, but I encourage you to take some hard paper copies that are here. There's more at the uh, UFRO SPDC booth that's just here on our left. I think it's on our left. Um, and there's a QR code where you can download the report from the UFRO website. So thank you very much. And thanks to my co-authors and the ones that weren't here today. But thanks, everyone, for your attention.